So welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited about this session because I do love early years and the massive impact that it can have. So I'm very excited to hear from the lovely Catherine. We uh, just a bit of housekeeping. We may have some AI note takers. So just to make you aware of that. And also, can you leave your um, microphones on mute for the presentation? We will take some questions hopefully at the end if we have some time. And um, Catherine, I haven't double checked, but can we share your slides at the end? Yes, of course. Yeah, fabulous. So to start us off, um, Minister Stephen Morgan, unfortunately, he was going to try and be here in person, but sadly, he wasn't able to do that. But we do have a lovely little video from him to introduce himself, uh, to speak to you as forums and also to introduce Catherine for us. Helen, would you be able to uh, play the video for us, please? As the first ever Minister for Early Education, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you all today, and I'm sorry it isn't in person. I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing from lots of excellent speakers, including a keynote speech from Catherine McLeod, CEO of Dingley's Promise, who we know has and continues to work tirelessly to ensure equity and inclusion for people with disabilities, to share her expertise and actively work to build inclusion of children with SEND in the early years across England. Today's conference is also an excellent opportunity for you to network with other parent carer forums and to engage with one another. I want to start by saying thank you to the parent carer forums, their members and the NNPCF, who through the participation contract continue to work with the department to ensure co-production at national and regional level embed the voices of families with SEND. Your work holds a special place in early years. We have an ambitious mission to break down the barriers to opportunity and give all children the best start in life. For too long, children and young people with SEND have been let down by a system that's not working, such as long waits for assessments in EHC plans, but this government is determined to deliver change. Every child with SEND should be able to access high quality early years provision with a workforce who can nurture a child's needs, recognise their strengths and build effective relationships with parents to ensure all children are safe, cared for and able to learn. Urgent work is already underway to ensure more children are getting earlier and better support to thrive in education through our curriculum and assessment review, Ofsted reforms and new early years SEND training and assessment guidance. We're also reviewing our funding arrangements for early years children with SEND and began a programme of work early this year to identify the challenges and barriers provided and parents are facing when accessing early years SEND funding streams. The work is not just going on in early years. The government is continuing to develop plans to transform England's SEND system and improve outcomes for children and young people of all ages. The government will provide a £1 billion uplift in high needs funding, recognising the immense need for proper funding in the sector for our children and services most in need, and taking an important step in returning local authorities to sustainability. We are on a journey to deliver for this country so that every child can have the best start in life. By working together, I hope we can break down the barriers to opportunity and reach many more children with the outstanding services that you provide. Thank you and enjoy today's conference. Thank you, Helen. So, um, and thank you to the Minister for that lovely welcome. And now I'm going to hand over to you, Catherine, to uh, tell us all the exciting work that Dingley's does and the massive difference it makes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my slides. Right, can everybody see that? Uh, yeah, lovely. Perfect. Right. Um, I'm really, really happy to be able to talk to you all today because um, certainly Dingley's Promise as an organisation works really, really closely with families. And we we see our work in three pillars. And yes, the child is one of those pillars, but the family is the second pillar. Um, and we do believe that the family has to be involved at every stage of whatever we do. So, I, you know, we've worked with a lot of parent carer forums and we really, really appreciate the work that, that all of you do. So what I'm going to do today 
is to have a look at firstly who are Dingley's Promise, in case you haven't heard of us before, um, then going on to look at inclusion in the early years and the national picture and follow that with an inclusive mindset and what it is that we want to see in early years settings, the way that they work with our children. Um, we'll then move on to looking a little bit at parent partnership and how we're working to encourage that in different groups, um, followed by some tools that can help. So tools that can also help you um, when you're looking at either lobbying locally or helping children access the early years. And then finally, how you can get involved. <clears throat> So I'm starting off with a little bit about Dingley's Promise. So I'm the chief executive. I've been the chief executive for almost 10 years now. Um, and as a, as a charity, we support children with SEND directly in our centres. We currently have six centres. We should have 11 by the end of the financial year. Um, we've supported thousands of children and families over, um, well, since 1983. I have to keep changing that number because <laughs> as time goes on. Um, and what's been really exciting about the work that we do is that when I joined, the organisation didn't have a very clear view on inclusion and on driving inclusion. But we believe that specialist provision should be driving wider inclusion wherever possible, where it's right for the child and the family. So 10 years ago, only 35 percent of our children children left us to go to the mainstream and that's now settled at about 70 percent of the children who leave us go to the mainstream so it's something we're really committed to but obviously we want every child to go to the right setting for them when they leave the early years so outside of our centers we also have a huge program now um, which focuses on training and influencing to bring about a wider improvement um, in the country so we our training program um, trains practitioners in mainstream settings to be better able to work inclusively we currently have around 18,000 um, early years practitioners on that training and that will go up to 30,000 by the end of 2026 so what that should reach 10 percent of the whole population of early years practitioners um, and we also advise and support the department for education we work very closely with them we're advising and supporting Ofsted and we're really trying to influence all those conversations to make sure that nobody forgets our children whether that's people working in disability forgetting the early years or people working in the early years forget they need to think about children with SEND. So we are the organisation that makes sure that our children are not forgotten. So when we look at the, this is the, this is the really grim part, so I'm sorry, this is where you're all going to feel a bit despondent, but I'll get through this quite quickly. So at the moment, um, inclusion in the early years in England is not going particularly well and actually is getting worse. So through um, research from the Early Years Alliance, 73% of settings say the number of children with SEND is rising. I've seen more recent research which, take, which takes that number into the 90s. So it's certainly uh, there's certainly a growth in demand and need. Um, on top of that, 28% of settings have turned children with SEND away. And what we had found, obviously, it's the right of every child to access an early years provision. And certainly when we surveyed families, one in five told us they'd been turned away by an early years setting because of their children's needs. So this is something obviously that's not acceptable and it seems to be growing at the moment. So we're working really hard to get the message across. That that's not acceptable. 92% um, um, of settings have had to use their own money to support children with SEND. Um, again, with that's that leads links into the conversations we're having with government around how our early support um, programs funded and whether those early years funding streams are properly funded or not. The early years is often the part of the education sector that gets forgotten. And, you know, at worst, it's, you know, often old male decision makers who look at it and say oh do you know what it's just those guys who play in sand with children it's just fun and they don't realize that actually the early years has the biggest impact on a child's life outcomes um, and then finally around inclusion i'm sure lots of you will recognize this but we have a staffing crisis in the early years sector but also um there's issues around accessing specialists to be able to support um, going through diagnosis or getting early support for children. And so that as well builds up the pressure. 
All of that leads to, at the moment, only 6% of local authorities believe they have enough provision for all children with SEND, which is absolutely scandalous. Uh, in the last year, that dropped from 18%, which we were already complaining about. It's dropped to 6%. So the situation is dire at the moment. And with the new early years entitlements, what normally happens is when there are increased entitlements, um, the provision available for our children drops because settings are under pressure. They need to take more children. And so they look at children and think those two are going to be easier to take. But actually that child, we may need to apply for funding. We may need to do this. And they're turning children with send away. So this is what we're dealing with at the moment. I'm, I promise. Oh, no, there's one more that's a bit grim and then we'll start to be more positive. So impact on families. And again, I don't really need to tell you this, but I, I you know, I'm I'm also the parent of a of a young person with autism and you know and i think we all recognize how difficult the system is and how difficult it is to get what we know our children deserve i just thought sometimes the numbers are are quite interesting to see so contact research showed that while um 61 of mothers worked only 16 percent of mothers with disabled children worked so it's that massive impact on on having to care and support and go to appointments as opposed to being able to continue in um, in a career. We had a, um, a mother recently who spoke in one of our sessions for local authorities because we often try to help local authorities to understand how serious the impact is when families can't get access to early years, who was a really successful, uh, she had a really successful career and ended up um, giving up her job, her marriage broke up, single parent, and then was ended up struggling with poverty. And I think it's 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 one of those areas where you can't underestimate what happens when you can't get the right support for your child and it affects every part of life. So here you've also got the contact research saying one in five people say that uh, parents say that their isolation has led to a breakup of their family life. 72% say it's led to mental ill health. Um, as I say, I don't want to underestimate the impact because the impact on families is so, so huge in those earliest years. And what we want to do is to get the children the best start and give families that confidence that actually the system can work. Um, and at the moment, we're very, very far from that. Oh, no. There we go. Sorry. Um, so within the settings themselves, and this is uh, what I wanted to share with you is very much the the way that we talk to settings and that we understand what's going on, because I think it's obviously completely wrong not to accept children with send into a setting. But at the same time, it is worth understanding why that's happening. And all of these things underpin the sort of messages we're taking to government. Um, about how they need to change the system. So in settings, those barriers to inclusion that we've identified through the last four years of working with them, um, excessive paperwork. Um, and I think for families as well, that that excessive paperwork doesn't serve us because actually we have to repeat our stories again and again, which in itself is not what we really want to be doing. And also I think the nature of that paperwork, whereby you have... Um, in order to get disability access funding, you need to get your disability living allowance. And for a lot of families, especially in the earliest years, we may not be ready to have those conversations, which tend to be very deficit focused, all about what your child can't do. And at that very early stage, it's not a nice process to go through. Um, lack of staff, the earliest sector is on its knees at the moment and is really struggling. A lot of settings have closed. Um, and so, of course, settings are saying when we've got a lack of staff, we don't have the ability to enhance ratios to support children who maybe have higher needs. Um, there's little free practical training, um, very long waits for therapists. Again, early years is often not prioritised for things like educational psychologists. They're often much more active in schools than in early years. So there tends to be a long wait for therapists and insufficient funding, which is a, an early years sector issue. Right. I'm going to move on from the really grim parts now. So that's the situation we're in. But obviously we're not sitting back and just saying it's bad and we can't do anything because I, yes, I'll stop working and doing my job when I think that. But I, we do believe we can make things better and we're working very hard to. Um, one of the first things that we do, and I wanted to share this with you, is that when we talk to settings, we really talk to them about 
the importance of having an inclusive mindset. Um, what that always starts with what we say about parents and saying to the settings, the parents are the experts in their children and you absolutely have to work in partnership with parents, but also that parents want honesty. We've seen a lot of settings who feel uncomfortable about having conversations that they see as difficult conversations with families. And what happens is that means the conversation doesn't happen. People muddle through. You miss the chance for that early intervention and support because actually they're not confident to have that conversation with families. So we really, really try to work with settings to push them to have those conversations. Um, one to one support is not always best. This is a controversial one because um, certainly set a lot of settings may feel that if they have a child with any kind of send, there should be a one to one adult who can stick to them, support them and make sure that um, it doesn't affect the other staff. Um, that's not something that we would agree to in the vast majority of cases. And certainly research on life outcomes shows that one to ones do not improve life outcomes for children in the early years, for the majority of children in the early years. And therefore, it's something we're working really hard on to try to give them the confidence and the knowledge to work inclusively and to really support children and allow children to play with each other and not have that constant adult on them because that is better for their outcomes. So that's something that we're really strong about. Um, the third one is around behaviour. Um, and, you know, I, I know a lot of us will have heard uh, professionals saying, well, your child's behaviour is challenging, um, which is not really the angle that we would we would take. Um, certainly we say to settings, all behaviour is communication. You know, you need to look at why a child is is feeling and acting in the way they are and how you can work with that to, to help support them better and help them thrive. Um, it's it's an area where we do have one of our training courses and we did call it um, behaviour that challenges because we realised that if you don't call it that, <clears throat> the settings don't realise what, what the training is about. And so we had we had consultation with families about that, actually, that course title. And we came to an agreement that that's what we were going to call it because we wanted to put the emphasis on the professional is challenged by the behaviour as opposed to the behaviour itself is innately challenging. So it's <laughs> we're trying to, to shift it that way, because obviously it's something that we all feel strongly about, that it's communication. It's not about a child being bad. Um, some inclusion is better than none. Um, so I think what we've found is that where the split between specialist and mainstream is less black and white, you allow for moving between those services. And certainly, again, with the life outcomes research, life outcomes are better having some experience of inclusion. So we very much focus on if a child is going to thrive in an inclusive environment, then we'll support them to get there. It may be that in three, four, five years, they will go to specialist education when they need that. However, some inclusion will be better for their life outcomes to be alongside their peers than none. Um, Good in inclusive practice helps everyone and is everyone's work. So, again, I think sometimes <clears throat> we get feelings from people when they say, look, you know, if we if we have that child in the setting, we need to do this thing to help that child and that will be good for them. But it, you know, it's extra work and, and that's sort of the, the feeling about it. But actually, certainly good inclusive practice is relevant to high quality teaching, which is what Ofsted wants, which is what we as families want as well. We want high quality teaching for our children and it does benefit every one of the children in a setting, um, especially when you think about things like um, the um, communication environment. I've certainly had a parent say to me in the past, well, I don't want my child to learn how to sign. I want them to learn how to talk. So, again, it's really making it clear to families and to settings that one communication strategy doesn't replace others it actually builds on others and it will help children to to reach whatever is the right communication strategy for them um every child is an individual this might sound a bit obvious um but what i mean by this is that when sometimes when professionals know a child for example with down syndrome they say oh i've had one of those don't worry i know what to do and I think that what we found is sometimes people have a little bit of knowledge and they then think that 
they know it all. And and so we're really, really strong with settings about saying, well, you may know one child with Down syndrome, but not every child with Down syndrome thinks the same, does the same or wants the same kind of support and input. And it's the same with lots and lots of diagnoses. So it's really important that we help um, professionals to realise that they absolutely have to get to know every child as an individual and a little bit of knowledge doesn't mean they can blanket the same approaches with every child. And then finally, the celebratory approach. So we work a lot with settings and with professionals around the language they use, around the way they talk about our children and about the I suppose the aims that they have with our children as well. And, you know, it's celebrating who our children are, making sure that um, when we when they talk about plans or targets, it, you know, we're focusing on potential and we're focusing on how children will develop into the future. And it's not about, well, oh, they can't do this or they're never going to do that because too many of our families have heard that from professionals. They'll never do this. And I don't know about you, but I, when a doctor tells me something, I tend to listen to them. And unfortunately, there's quite a lot of that health input that can be non-celebratory. So that's something that's really, really important. So again, when we're looking at the early years um, effective inclusion, what we would say is um, any setting needs to have really good early identification, which means great child development knowledge among their staff. We want them to see what our children need as early as possible and then be able to start to give them that support. So that early intervention it's, um, is described as the graduated approach in the early years. So it's that's assess, plan, do, review. So that's the graduated approach. And what we really want to see is that every early year setting the the professionals in that setting understand you know we have a role it's not just about specialist input it's not just about getting the occupational therapist or the speech and language therapist to come in in of course ask them to come in but while you're waiting for them to come in it's again working with families to say right so this is we've assessed now we have um a plan this is what we think is going to work how do you feel then they try a strategy if that strategy works great if it doesn't work they learn from it and then they'll try the next strategy so it's really about empowering earlier settings to keep working to understand each individual child and their needs and how to how to meet those needs best uh, an enabling environment. So that's the physical environment, making sure that there's enough space for children, making sure there's um, quiet spaces for children as well. If they're feeling dysregulated, there's um, and also making sure there's um, a lot of physical opportunities to uh, make decisions, because, again, something we often see is especially where there's one to one adults or two or a lot of adults around is making decisions for children with SEND and just sort of thinking they know best for that child rather than letting the child choose things themselves. So that's something we have to guard against um, the communication environment. Again, it's all those different types of communication strategy strategies, making sure they're across the whole setting um, and that children can develop the communication strategy that supports their learning and their development. And then sensory um, is, again, going through all of the sensory areas and considering how a setting might affect children. Um, and certainly we also encourage um, a sensory circuit, which is a, a sensory sort of routine. And often it's done at the beginning of the day and it helps children to um, sort of understand how they're feeling. It helps them to focus um, and it helps them to regulate themselves. So that's something that we certainly suggest in settings. It's something to ask for if you're visiting a setting to say, do you do you use um, sensory circuits? So that's really important. Um, and then for on a more practical side, I know as parents, we often go into places and think, oh, it's beautiful. There's all these cartoons on the wall and it looks so exciting. It's fantastic. That's the setting I really want. But what what we do need more of is calm, calm areas, not just the areas, but the calm environment in the setting, because actually for a lot of children, that is overwhelming. And it, it's it's something that seems to appeal to a lot of adults who think that's what a fun early years setting should be. But actually, for a lot of our children, it's just too much. So that's another one to think about when it comes to sensory. Um, parent partnership we will go on to in a minute, because obviously I want to go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, 
High quality transitions, that transition from early years into school is a real pinch point. It's really difficult. And obviously for us as parents who have to make decisions around do I want my child to go into a mainstream school or a mainstream school unit or um, or a special school? It, there's a whole other layer of stress for us thinking about what's best for our children. But I think also there's, there's a whole layer of stress for the um, pr practitioners in the settings as well, because they realise it's a really important process. They are going to have to have conversations that may become difficult. So I think it is it's it's quite a stressful time. So we say start as early as possible, which is ideally the September before, um, with all of that process and making sure there are sort of shared expectations. And again, centering the family to make sure that the family is really aware of what's happening and always informed. Um, and the final one is just inclusive curriculum. So again, we're working with settings at the moment to help them understand how to make sure their curriculum really, really works for all the children. It's flexible. Uh, it's not about fitting children into particular holes, but it is about saying, how can we understand each child and help them to learn alongside each other? Even if the targets they have are differentiated, they, they will still learn together. So parent partnership, um, this is all going to sound probably quite obvious um, as parents, but I think, I'd, again, I wanted to make you aware of what it is that we talk to settings about and tell them is best practice. So we talk about having a home visit to understand the family situation as standard, um, joint thinking and target setting, absolutely critical. Um, I've been in a situation where I found out about six months later that my child was on a was on a particular plan which no one had bothered to tell me about or introduced to me um and i think um we have to be really really focused on making sure we're involving parents at all stages as as educators um and that is that regular contact as well. And I know that we've heard from a lot of families that sometimes when there's no progress, and unfortunately, I think we all know situations where there's no progress when we're trying to get things for our children. But often I think professionals feel embarrassed about that and they think, oh, I better not call them or I better not update them because there's nothing to tell them. So, again, we have we, we've sort of sh told them that a lot of families tell us they would rather have just a, do you know what? I'm still on this. I'm on your side. I'm working for you, but still we don't have any progress, but that's better than leaving it silent. Because I think when there's silence and when we don't know what's going on, obviously we feel like, well, possibly that's bad news and we, things will happen in our minds when we don't have information from people. And yeah, so so I think that's a really important part regular progress meetings, online observation exchange. So again, just keeping in touch with families and making sure they know exactly what's happening. Um, support and signposting to other services. Again, early years, we're often not um, the most highly represented in um, in meetings with, um, uh, sorry, just lost it. Um, we're often not the most highly represented in um, parent forums. And so it is one of those areas where I think there's a lot fewer families from the early years in most of our parent care forums. So what we always say to settings is find out who your local parent care forum is. Make sure you are signposting any parents to that because it's not something that most of them have ever thought about. So we really, really underline that to get them to do that, as well as other services um, for um, families of children with SEND in the early years. Um, Focus on statutory paperwork and meeting deadlines. I mean, yeah, we again, we underline to them very much. The statutory pa paperwork is critical. You've got to meet your deadlines. Um, yeah, that's that goes without saying, really. Again, the parent is the expert of the child, but with that challenge that, that parents say they do want. So it is having those conversations. And I think it's worth remembering that we did some research into who parents trust in the early years and certainly the early years practitioners in our settings are the most trusted group of professionals in the research according to parents so actually they have a really they can have a really important role on supporting us as parents to sort of say well you know we're here for you and we will help you through this journey and I just think that we're very strong with settings that they're they're 
verbal support, the way that they, they work with those families will have a big influence on how they're feeling about the journey and how they're feeling about what is possible for their children. So we, we try to make that really clear to them that they have a big responsibility at that time because they are the most trusted professionals around those families. So again, around still linked to families, we work a lot with local authorities and obviously with the settings. There are some really practical things that we say should be happening. So with local authorities, obviously, we're constantly saying they have to interact, listen and co-produce with parents. I know I've said the co-produce word and there's people there probably going, oh, God, they all say co-produce. I know. But we do keep trying to push them because it is really important. Um, what we also ask them to do is pr promote ordinarily available provision documents and obviously send DIAS services as well. The ordinarily available provision document tells uh, families what as standard should be available. It exists in schools as well, um, but in the early years one, it's very much it should tell families this is what you can expect from your early years setting. And sometimes if we as families don't know that, settings can quite easily say to us oh no that's way more than we could possibly do or oh, i don't think we'll be able to do that but actually once you have that oap document you can see all these things should be standard and it may it gives a lot of power to a family to say actually i know that you should be offering all of these things so it's just a really good document to, to have to be able to then um sort of make sure that you're getting the right support for your child um, we tell local authorities they need to add parent satisfaction into local data. A lot of the data in local authorities focuses on EHCP timeliness, um, and that I think is the main one. And obviously they look at if they have enough places, but very few of them do. But what we try to do is to say, actually, parent satisfaction should be something on your formal numbers and when your leaders are looking at your numbers we want to see parent satisfaction in those numbers um so that's something that we talk to them about a lot and we also ask them to create case studies of child success so where children are thriving whether it be in specialist or mainstream or units we just ask them to create positive case studies so families can see okay that's how that could work um, I think often when there are problems, we hear the stories. We don't often hear about the success stories. So I've, I often encourage them to do more of that. With settings, as I've said, involving families in everything and always updating them, um, we very much push settings to get training for all staff. And the Level 3 Senko Award was funded by the government. It's really important. Um, and... Uh, sorry, so can I just quickly check what time um, I am I am stopping for questions? Can I just check that quickly? <laughs> so. um, well, it'd be good to have 15, 20 minutes for questions. So another five minutes ish. Lovely. OK, I will try. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, so with that training, they do have the level three training just for the SENCO. But again, families tell us it's great that the SENCO understands SEND. But actually what we want is every single staff member in that setting to be able to include our children effectively. And so that's what we're working really hard on at the moment with our training, trying to get that to every practitioner. And we also tell settings have a one pager of services that you can refer families to, because, again, sometimes not every practitioner in a setting will have all the information that they need um, to to really refer families to other services. So we ask managers and owners to create short documents that they can then give to families so they can easily um, get more support. Tools. So I've talked about the ordinarily available provision and why that's so important. And I've mentioned graduated approach and the fact that um, our earlier settings should be working really hard to identify need and try strategies even before potentially other professionals come in. Um, the Department for Education's Early Years Assessment Guidance was launched last month. It's a really, really good document um, that goes through identifying need. It's something that parents can look at and we're trying to get that implemented across the whole country so that even when you move local authority areas or you move between settings, the dream is they will all be using the same thing. So that, as I say, only launched a month ago, but that should help because, again, it means for families, you don't keep repeating your story over and over again because it's the same document and it can actually move between services. So that's a really important thing. And then obviously I'm going to mention the Dingley's Promise Inclusion Training. 
So there are five live courses at the moment. That's a horrible picture of me sitting there on that laptop. Sorry, I've just noticed that. Um, it's uh, free to access locally for a lot of local authority areas. Um, and it's about five hours of study, three hours of video, and it's completely flexible. So the importance of this is obviously we want to embed that strong, inclusive knowledge and confidence in our settings. And once we have that, the I think one of the really important changes is you see parents much more welcomed into the setting because practitioners already feel the confidence that when they know that a child has some kind of additional need, they're thinking, I know what to do here. I know that what the processes are. I know what strategies I'm going to try. Whereas when they don't have that confidence and you arrive as a family, you may not get the welcome that you should get in a setting. Um, very briefly to mention, we launched a manifesto for early years inclusion last year, um, and that has got recommendations around, again, that training for the workforce, simplifying the funding and making sure that we can get enough funding into the early years so that settings can really support our children properly. And then also looking at those horrible sufficiency numbers where only 6% at the moment have enough for children with SEND. Um, so we've been working with government on how we can make that better. So. I'm right. I'm wrapping up now. You'd be very pleased to hear, Sarah. Um, so with um, I just wanted to add a few little things around how you can potentially get involved or um, or know more about what we do. So one thing is, if you have a child in the early years or if you have lo um, relatives or friends who work in, in local settings, tell them about the inclusion training, because actually the more we've we've got a parent steering group for our training program. And it's really interesting how now, when they really push it locally, a lot more settings are taking up the training because they realise it's something that parents are now starting to demand. So you have a power there to actually help practitioners to get uh, more skilled and confident in supporting children with SEND. Um, go onto our website, sign up to our newsletter. Uh, we've got Facebook groups as well. So again, any of the new developments, you can see them all there. Um, consider volunteering to speak at an event. So we are increasingly um, holding events in Westminster and really talking to um, government about uh, parent views. And what I would say is with the new government, they've never been so focused on SEND and early years as previously. Um, and so they are actually really engaging now. And one of the first questions they ask me in every meeting I go into is what are parents saying? That is literally the first question in all of my meetings. So they do want to hear. So again, if you want to get involved, if you want to tell your story, let us know, because um, obviously we will, we're, we're organising those events fairly regularly in the future. Uh, if you don't want to do that yourself, and lots of us may not want to do that, send us your concerns. So my email is at the end of this. If there is anything that you think needs to be highlighted, we can take that to government um, on your behalf for the early years. Um, contribute to strategy groups in your local authority. I know lots of you are already doing that. And then I've got join your local parent voice organisation. I know you are the parent voice organisations, but it's just I think on all of my all of my um, discussions with parent carers, it's just trying to really build that we need to get in earlier. We need to get parents in so they feel supported coming out of early years, because often that feels like a cliff coming out of early years and going into school. And if they've got that support from their parent voice organisation, that's really important. Thank you ever so much. That's my everything. There's a joyous face. So we've ended it joyous. No, I was just going to say, beginning. you missed one thing. I've worked with oh. Catherine for many, many years and I, <laughs> her units are in our my local area and we absolutely loved by everybody. But you missed the fact that your training and how many additional places from the AGM, you had a figure. It was over 3,000 additional SEND places mm. nationally, wasn't it, that came out yeah. of your training. And I think that's the bit for me that really struck home is that how many additional places now are available for our SEND children, which is so important. Yeah. What was the figure? I think, I've forgotten. Well, I think it's now approaching 6,000 because wow. it's really, really, um, yeah, there's lots of momentum. So, uh, yeah, it's about 6,000 places created through the training from practitioners saying they can take more children with SEND because they're more confident and knowledgeable. Fabulous. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I hope everyone found that really interesting. And um, have people got some questions? They're usually really talkative, but they've been quite quiet today. <laughs> I won't take it personally. <laughs> There's some 
questions in the chat. Um, Linda has asked, um, how does your organisation connect with health professionals um, as these are the people that the parents will see most within the early years? Yeah, so we work really close with them in the areas where our centres are and they'll often come into the centre and work with children and families in our centre because it's a it's a known environment and the children are normally happier there. Um, I think on a more national level, we so pretty much. Sorry. No, I coughed. Sorry, carry on. Oh, sorry. OK, that's right. Um, <laughs> on a national level, um, we are sort of we're in discussions with various um i don't know are they called ccgs anymore or has it changed ICBs. again ICBs. icbs that was it sorry so we're we're in discussions with the with the regional icbs so we talk to them um around early years send and certainly with the new assessment guidance we're working with the dfe at the moment to try to promote that to the nhs so that they also will start to use that in two-year-old checks and other processes like that so it's it is something that we do. Um, what I would say is our services at the moment, none of our services are funded by health, which is a little bit strange. But um, we are funding in local areas is from the local authority. So we advise the local authority to talk to the NHS to see if they can come in in partnership. But um, yeah, from from that point of view. Um, oh, and what I would also say is in all of our training, we also have health professionals coming in to give their feedback in peer review as well. So we, we, we work very closely with them. Um, but I would say we're more education focused as an organisation. We've had a couple of questions in the chat around whether parent care forums often run a stay and play sessions or whether or not they can do your training. Yeah, of course they can. Absolutely. If they go onto our website, um, if I quickly chuck it in here, uh, um, if they go onto our website, there's a good little tool you can put in your local area and then see if the training is available for free in your area. And if it is, then literally jump on it and access as much as you possibly can, because while it's free, we want to get it out as widely as possible. It's not free, Catherine. How can... Um how can that be funded within local areas is it your is it local authorities that are funding that well it's a big mix so in some areas it is the stronger practice hub project that is funding them so that will go until the end of march then 32 areas are funded through our comic relief project uh, which has got another two years to go and then some local authorities have bought the training in direct through the local authority as well. So there's a there's quite a few different ways, which is why we've got that tool on the website, because it's a bit confusing, to be honest. You're going to go, Jane? Jane? Yeah, <laughs> Jane's got a question. Jane, did you want to um, to come and ask a question? Yeah, sorry, technical again. My buttons are just not working today. Thank you, Catherine, for that. Amazing. It's absolutely amazing. My question is around family hubs. Because obviously now there's that initiative around family hubs in the first thousand and one days um, and a lot of stuff that we've seen I'm from the Yorkshire and Humber region around our region is and the 0 to 19 services um, how we could get basically get this training into into our family hubs so a lot of our forums work very closely with family yeah. hubs and would run things from there for send for send tots in particular that that element of family hubs uh, so is there anything so, on your website around that or yes yeah so we at the moment we're doing a project for the dfe the earliest send partnership and yeah. there's a lot of training through that for the family hub specifically family hub areas um what i would say is that again using that tool online you'll be able to see if it's if it's available for free in your area if it is a family hub um, it's always worth popping an email to our training team as well because we can see if we can wangle anything because to be honest I think that getting those family hubs to be really confident on inclusion in the early years is so important and so we yeah, I shouldn't say this Sarah is one of my trustees but um, yeah, close your <laughs> eyes is Sarah but wherever we can we'll wangle it you know we'll, we'll make sure that we can help you one know? of the things so I just love about you is how you got me to be a trustee because you wangle <laughs> I am a wangler. It's we true. get it with style. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Definitely be in touch. I love that. Lovely. Quite 
Love it. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions in the chat? If you, I think we've answered all of the, the covers in the point about hearing. Um, I've put the link in um, and Catherine's put the link in as well. Um, just lots of positivity from you um, for the work that you're doing um, in the chat, Catherine, which is absolutely Thank you. Um, fabulous. Did anybody else have any other questions There's that they the wanted that to ask? There's the cost <coughs> um, for Newham. Would it be OK if they email the training team and just asked about that and see if? Yeah. 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 Sorry, email absolutely. Them. I Sorry, think I'm presenting at the Newham Early Years Conference early next year as well. So I'll be in Newham, I think. So, yeah. OK. Sorry, just to add, um, this is from Newham. I checked the link that you sent, but there are figures attached to each one. So does that mean we have to pay for it? Because it's not showing free. Yeah. Have you put your area into yeah, I, the... I did that. Yeah, we did that. Then, then it, it came that up means it it's not available. That means it's not available for free in Newham at the moment. OK, so if you pay for it, then we can access it. Yeah, yeah. So it's right, it basically it's £50 pounds per course. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, thank you very yeah, much. We'll, we'll do yeah. that. Thank you. Sorry. I wish it's we were right. everywhere. We keep trying. We are trying. It's OK. <laughs> so, thank you very much. OK. Are there any other questions for Catherine? Wow, I think you've given them so much information, Catherine. That's been brilliantly well received. We've stunned them all into Good. silence. <laughs> Absolutely well, Catherine amazing. does always advocate getting in touch with your parent care forum because she knows that often they need that additional support as well. So it, it is a very good um, joint effort. Absolutely, always will. <laughs> oh well, that's fabulous, Catherine. Did you have anything else that you want to share? If not, we're we're happy to close the session um, five minutes early and give everyone back five five to ten minutes of their day today. Nope, that's all good. Like I say, thank you for everything that you guys do. Thank you for being there for families. You know, it's it's so important and we will keep promoting our um, parent care forums to everyone who comes into contact with Dingley. Oh, thank Jane's you, got... Catherine. I do appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Lovely. Thank you <laughs> no very worries. much. Oh, I think Jane wants the last oh, word. Jane's got Hold a last on. question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry. It's me again. Um, you know, in I've just gone onto the site and our area is not, um, it's saying it's, Take me onto a page with prices on. Is that price per person or for the course? It says um, introduction to early years, fifty pound. Yeah, so it's per person because they then register and then they Brilliant. get access online to their learning area. Yeah, that's that's great, Catherine. Thank you. We're just okay. So I know what to, to say when I'm saying it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. That's great. So thank you, everyone. We will give you five minutes back. So thank you so much for your time, Catherine. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today.